I would like to thank Brother Mike for reading our scriptural text on this morning, which came from the book of 1 Corinthians. The chapter was 6, and the verses were 9 through 11. But before we delve into this text, there's another verse or another passage of scripture that I'd like for us to read. As to this Sunday, we're going to begin a series of lessons over the next five Sundays dealing with the text of Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And so if you have your personal copy of God's word, please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew. The chapter is 1, and we're going to begin with verse 1 and read down to verse 6. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. It's based upon these passages of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, teaching Tamar. Teaching Tamar. Over the next four weeks, I think I said five, over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about the four women that are mentioned in these six verses of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And I want us to see in these four women a history of divine grace. A history of divine grace. You may be asking or you may even be wondering, wondering, who is Tamar? That is an unusual name. I've heard sermons my entire life. I've never heard of Tamar. I've heard of Tamar Braxton, but I have not heard of Tamar of the Bible. So who is Tamar? Well, I want us to know on this morning that Tamar is one of the five women mentioned in the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. She is a part of Jesus' history. Tamar was the wife of two men, a man by the name of Ur, and a man by the name of Onan. We read about that in Genesis chapter 38, verses 6 through 10. And without going into great detail as to who these men were, we know that they were sons of Judah, and God killed these men because of their disobedience and their wickedness. Being married uh, to these men made Tamar the daughter-in-law of a man that we do know about. And his name is Judah. Judah was the son of Jacob, the grandson of Isaac, and the great-grandson of a man by the name of Abraham. Judah did have a third son, and his name was Shelah, that he had promised to Tamar according to the law of the patriarch, that when he is of age, you will marry him. And we read about this promise in this conversation in Genesis chapter 38 and the verse 11. But we read something quite interesting as we see this narrative in Genesis chapter 38 that Judah failed to fulfill his promise, verse 14. And when he failed to keep his word to Tamar, this thing displeased Tamar. We see that in verse 14. Now, while in her father's house, so because Tamar no longer had a husband and she was a widow, she had to go back to her father's house and she had to put on the garments of a widow. 
But time had passed, and Shelah was of age, and Judah never sent for her. But something happened during this time. Judah's wife also died, and he himself is in mourning. And he finds himself in the hometown of Tamar. And word came to Tamar that said, your father-in-law is in town. And so Tamar says, well, since he did not keep his word, I'm going to fix this situation. And so she took off her widow garments and she put on the garments of a prostitute. And she covered her face. And she went to the street corner, solicited. And Judah passes by. And he decides to give in to her advances. And so Judah lays with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 38, verses 15 through 23. And so not only was Tamar displeased with Judah, but Tamar used deception to get her way in this situation. But then some time passed, and Tamar began to show because she was pregnant. She, was, she conceived during that time. And it was discovered that Tamar, who was supposed to be in her widow garments, was pregnant and with child. Then Judah, being the righteous patriarch that he is, decided to bring her out and make an example of her and burn her at the stake, according to the law of patriarchs for playing the harlot when she's supposed to be a widow. And so we see that in Genesis chapter 38, verse 24. Now, even though this was the law of the patriarchs that clearly was given to Judah by God, because we know that God spoke through the patriarchs in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it later became a law under the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 9. But then something happened before the fire got just right. When Judah was made aware that he himself was baby daddy. Then all of a sudden, things changed. He said, she is more righteous than I. He repented for not bringing his son to Tamar, and therefore it was through his sin and his, and his disobedience and his inactivity and his own fornication is what has brought about this situation. Tamar's life was spared. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 38, verses 25 and 26. And Judah bore twins, or Tamar gave birth to twin boys. One was named Perez, and the other was named Zerah. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 38, verses 27 through 30. Now, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit moved the Apostle Matthew to do what many believe to be two taboo things in identifying Tamar so that we can see God's grace and so that we can see God's mercy at work in this woman. But also in the lives of all those who will come to know Jesus for themselves. The first taboo thing Matthew does is that Matthew names women in the paternal lineage of the king of kings. This was something that just wasn't done. But Matthew in scripture does it. The second thing that he does that I find interesting is the fact that Matthew identifies women who were noted for doing shameful things. For their mere existence was shameful. He doesn't identify Sarah in the lineage. He doesn't identify Rebecca in the lineage. He doesn't identify Leah in the lineage. But he identifies the wife of Uriah. He identifies Rahab. He identifies Ruth. 
And just by reading Tamar's history just now, he identifies Tamar. These are the women that you don't want nobody to know you are related to. But Matthew brings it out for everybody to know that your Messiah, your King of Kings, your Lord of Lords, has some skeletons in his closet. He cannot tell the story of Jesus without telling the story of Tamar. Because we see that God used Tamar to bring salvation to many. For through Christ, many are saved. See, in life, my brothers and sisters, we will encounter many Tamars in our family. We will encounter some Tamars at work. When we evangelize, we will encounter some Tamars in this community who need to be taught the saving message of Jesus Christ. And so this message of Tamar that is being presented on this morning is designed to do three things. Number one, as hearers of God's word, we must understand that we all got some Tamar in us. See, sometimes we forget that Tamar's story used to be our story. That's why we had to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, in which Paul identifies, here are all the things God called you out of. And you used to be like this. So before the next adulterer walk in and you look down at them, remember that used to be you. When the next idolater walked in here and you look down at them, remember that used to be you. When the next swindler comes walking in here and you look down at them, that used to be you. And when the next Tamar comes walking through these doors with five kids with different last names and you decide you want to look down at her, remember that used to be you. So we all got some Tamar in us. Number two, as Christians, we must not shy away from individuals who remind us of Tamar, for they need Jesus. And just like God was able to use Tamar to bring the Messiah into the world, God can use these other individuals who remind you of Tamar to make an impact and a difference in the lives of many. Didn't God use you to make a difference in the lives of somebody else? And so we need to remember that if God can use Tamar, if God can use you, God can use anybody. And number three, as soul winners for Christ, we can and must use the story of Tamar to let the world know that we do have a sympathizing Savior who still desires to have them in spite of themselves. So when reading the book of Genesis, one would think that Joseph was the firstborn of Jacob. But as we read, we recognize that Joseph was son number 11. Nevertheless, he was the firstborn of Rachel, the wife, of, the wife that Jacob loved. When we look at Genesis chapter 38, the Bible actually takes a break. And so we read the story of Joseph, and then there's a break. And then we have Genesis chapter 38, in which instead of talking about Joseph, God decides to talk about Judah and Tamar. Now, one would think that Judah was the firstborn. After all, the king's bloodline tends to pass through the firstborn. But Judah was not son number one. He wasn't even son number two. He wasn't even son number three. Judah was son number four. Therefore, we cannot bring up Tamar unless we bring up Judah. And we cannot, cannot bring up Judah unless we talk about his brothers, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Let's start off by talking about this man by the name of Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob. 
But he committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bilhah. Now, Bilhah happens to be the handmaid of Rachel, the second wife of Jacob, thus making Bilhah the first concubine of Jacob, which means that nobody could be with Bilhah except for Jacob. But Reuben, after the death of Rachel, decides to go and have his way with Bilhah. We read about that in Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. And we're going to read later that Jacob never forgot about that. We also see that this man by the name of Reuben, he was not a leader. For him to be the firstborn, for him to be the oldest brother, he was not a leader. He was a follower. For he was a willing participant in the capture of his baby brother, Joseph. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 37, verses 21 and 22, as well as Genesis 37, verses 29 and 30. And the reason why we know that Reuben was a follower is because the younger brothers all decided that it was a good idea to take Joseph and kill him. So they threw him in a pit. And so there was a conversation. Reuben walks away. Judah decides to convince the people that maybe we shouldn't kill Joseph. Here come a band of Ishmaelites, let's sell them into slavery. Reuben is not a part of this conversation because Reuben figured that he would come out in the middle of the night, find out where this pit is, and while his brothers are asleep, he will come and rescue Joseph. So when he comes back, he realized that the pit is empty because his younger brothers sold Joseph into slavery. Well, Reuben, being the older brother, should have been the one to say, this is wrong. This is not right. But this older brother gives in to the will of the younger brothers. I mean, I wish that my younger sister ever tried to tell me, her oldest brother, what to do. I'm the older brother. I, I get the pull rank. If you're the oldest, you get the pull rank. So even if the younger ones are deciding that we want to do this horrible thing, you have to say something about that. You're the oldest. I mean, don't you know that the oldest gets in trouble regardless of what the younger does? I mean, it's like, you're the oldest. You should have known better. You should have stopped this. And we see that Jacob, once again, does not forget about this. Now, notice that when it was required by the governor of Egypt to bring Benjamin to Egypt to prove that Jacob's sons were not spies. So we're talking 13 years later that they have been promoting this lie that Joseph is dead. Now Joseph is in charge, 20 years later rather, it's 20 years later at this point. He is now in charge of all of Egypt and now they have to come and they have to beg this governor, their own brother, for food. And so Joseph is having fun with them seeing that they really learned their lesson. He says, who are you guys? They say, hey, we are, we are the sons of a father who has 12 sons. He says, I only count 10. They said, well, one died, and the baby brother is still at home. He says, well, I don't believe you. Go get the younger brother. So they come back, and they tell Jacob what has been decreed. Jacob says, how did you tell them I got other kids? <laughs> but yet, they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make a deal. Reuben stands up and says, put Benjamin in my charge. And if I don't come back with Benjamin, you can take my kids. So Reuben is not willing to sacrifice himself. But he's willing to sacrifice his children, just like he was willing to sacrifice his brother, Joseph. The actions of Reuben made him a fornicator made him a coward, and made him selfish. So hear the words of Jacob as Jacob is on his deathbed in Genesis chapter 49, verses 3 and 4. The Bible reads in Genesis chapter 49, verse 3 and 4, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, unstable as water. 
You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. So this is why we see Jesus not coming through Reuben. But what about Simeon and Levi? Those are the next brothers, Simeon and Levi. Well, let's talk about Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi are child number two and child number three. They're son number two, son number three. Simeon and Levi, they had a sister by the name of Dinah. And this girl, Dinah, was defiled by the prince of the land. In other words, her virginity was taken from her. Now, based upon the law of the patriarchs, a bride price was required to make Dinah the wife of the prince. We read of a similar law in the Mosaic age when we take a look at Exodus chapter 22, verses 16 and 17. So Simeon and Levi required that the prince and all the men pay this price, and the price was circumcision. They say, you want to marry my sister? You're going to have to become like us. You're going to have to be circumcised. And the prince says, that's it? All of us just have to be circumcised and I get to be with your sister? They were like, all right, here's the decree. All men be circumcised. So everybody in the land was circumcised. Now, as these men were recovering from this archaic surgery, because they didn't have lasers back then. <laughs> they didn't have scalpels back then. They didn't have knives as we know them today back then. But yet these men were able to do this thing called circumcision. So as they are recovering, because it was painful, Simeon and Levi, while these men were defenseless, went into the camp and killed them all killed them all in Genesis chapter 34. But Simeon and Levi came up with the promise, came up with the deal, came up with the arrangement. Simeon and Levi were liars. They were men that were controlled by anger, and they were murderers. So hear what Jacob has to say about these two sons on his deathbed when we look at verses 5 through 7 of Genesis chapter 49. The Bible reads, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men. And in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. And their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now we know the story of Tamar. We read the story of Reuben. We read the story of Simeon. We read the story of Levi. And when we hear about what Judah did, Judah is no different than his older brothers. So why Judah instead of Reuben? Why Judah instead of Simeon? Why Judah instead of Levi? Well, what made Judah different from Reuben, Simeon, and Levi was the fact that Judah did something that the other three refused to do. Judah was a man of repentance. Judah repented. Judah recognized the error of his way, stopped the sin, confessed his fault, and started to do the right thing. He was a man that was all about making it right. He knew how to say, I am sorry. He knew how to say, I am wrong. He knew how to make restitution. What can I do to make this right? He knew how to turn away from his error and start doing the right. He knew how to ask for forgiveness. See, Judah was a fornicator, and Judah was a deceiver. But the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 38, verses 15 through 26, that he repented of them both. Judah sold his little brother Joseph into slavery. When you look at the text in Genesis 37, verses 25 through 28, it was Judah's idea. Don't kill him, sell him. But Judah repented of this. 
Because notice that it was Judah that when Jacob was mad and said, why did you tell him I have a son named Benjamin? When Reuben stood up and said, if I don't come back with Benjamin, you can have my kids. Judah says, no, dad, put Benjamin in my care. And if I don't come back with Benjamin, you can have my life. Because he remembered what he did to Joseph. And he realized that the only way to make this right, if the same thing was to happen to Benjamin, was that his life be given in exchange for his brother. And so, this brings us to the words of Jacob towards his son Judah on his deathbed. In Genesis chapter 43, uh, 49, verses 8 through 12, the Bible reads, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his fowl to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And so we talked about Tamar, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. For what purpose? What are we to learn from the story of these individuals? What are we to learn from the story of Tamar? What is three points? And then the lesson is yours to respond to. Point number one is that God is holy. God is absolutely holy. He will not tolerate wickedness. He will not tolerate disobedience. If you don't believe me, ask Ur what happened as a result of his wickedness. Ask Onan what happened as a result of his wickedness. Ask Reuben what happened as a result of his wickedness. Ask Simeon what happened as a result of his wickedness. Ask Levi what happened as a result of their wickedness. Even Judah, who began to be called out and feel the, feel the wrath of God, he knew that he needed to repent and make things right because God is holy. He cannot and he will not tolerate sin. And we need to see this from this story, that God will not tolerate wickedness. Number two, when we look at Tamar, we recognize that Tamar, she had a hard life. This is why when people come and they worship with us and they visit with us and sometimes their response to a message may be different than what you traditionally have done, you don't know what they have come from. You don't know their history. You don't know what they had to go through to walk through those doors this morning. Tamar had a hard life. She lost not one husband, but two husbands to death. She was a widow. She lied. She was lied to by someone that she trusted. She made some bad choices due to desperation and anger. She used deception to get her way. She played the harlot. She was sentenced to death. And she had two sons out of wedlock. You know, we come in contact with people daily who identify with one, some, many, or even all of these things that Tamar went through in her life. Yet, God was still able to use Tamar. Therefore, if God can use Tamar to usher in the reign 
of our Savior, Jesus Christ, then who are we to suggest that such a person today will not respond to the gospel call? We must share the gospel because the gospel is the very thing this world needs. And number three, number three, Reuben was a fornicator, he was a coward, and he was selfish. Simeon and Levi, they were liars, they were men controlled by anger, and they were murderers. Believe it or not, my friends, they are no different than people in our family. They are no different than people at work. They are no different than people in this community. And if we are honest, some of us used to be identified in the same way. Unfortunately, some of us are still struggling with such sins. Some of us still struggle with fornication. Some of us, even though we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we still struggle with being cowards. We still struggle with selfishness. We still struggle with the truth. We still struggle with anger. We still struggle with taking life and wanting to kill somebody and wanting to put our religion on the shelf so that we can forget that we're Christians temporarily and give somebody a piece of our mind. We still struggle with these things from time to time. And it appears that there is no hope for people like us. It appears that there is no hope for people who are overcome with these things. It appears that there is no hope for individuals that have gone through or may be able to identify with the things that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. But through Judah, we learn that there is power in this thing called repentance. If we simply change our minds and stop practicing sin, then God will forgive. Therefore, we must teach Tamar, for God demands it of us. Where do you stand on this morning? Maybe you have walked in here, and you said, my name is not Tamar, but I could be. It could be. Well, this is your opportunity to make things right with your God. Be like Judah and say, this life that I'm living, I don't want to live any longer. I've done it my way. It has not worked. I'm going to try it another way. I want to try it God's way. God stands ready to receive you on this morning. We was about to put the cover back on the baptistry, but we said, no, today is still the Lord's day. We still may get some more use out of it this morning. And so if you don't want to make a liar out of me, but you do want to make a liar out the devil, then come on down this aisle this morning. Give me your hand, but give God your heart and give him your word that you're going to live for him from this day forward, and God will keep his word, and that is he will forgive you of your sins. He'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. He'll add you to his church, the only church you can read about in Scripture. See, the reason why we know everything that we have read is true, because we can read it. And so I can read where Jesus says he was going to build his church in Matthew 16, 18. I can read where he built his church in Acts chapter 2. I can read where he purchased that church with his own blood in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I can read where he adds the saved to the church in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. I can read where his church is identified as church of Christ in Romans chapter 16, verse 16. So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord, which does all that God authorizes? You've heard his word, believe it. Do what Judah did, repent of your sins. Confess Christ to be the son of the living God and be baptized in water, having your sins washed away this day like our new brother in Christ, Edward, did on this morning. Maybe you are a Christian. Well, you know what? All these people that we're reading about in Scripture, they were a part of the covenant. 
And yet, look at the sins that they were wrapped up in. Judah had a covenant with God, yet he fornicated and was self-righteous. Reuben was in covenant with God, yet he fornicated, committed adultery, was a coward. Simeon and Levi were individuals that were in covenant relationship with God. Yet they were liars and controlled by anger. And Tamar was a woman that was in covenant with God. Yet she played the harlot just to manipulate and get Judah to do what Judah had promised to do, and that was to give her his son, so that she can have kids. And yet, we see that God, in this narrative, was able to use Judah and was able to use Tamar to do a great thing. So here, here, here's the message in that. You may be a Christian, you may be in covenant with God, and you may have fallen short of his glory, but if you're still breathing, that just simply means that God's not through with you yet. This is your opportunity to make things right with him so that Jesus can receive glory through your restoration. Wherever you are on this morning, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected. <laughs>